25 years ago, in the late 1980s, my children were gr grown and my psychology practice was well established. And I was looking for a new challenge. I was interested in finding new ways to give back to my community and to contribute meaningfully to making my city an even better place to live. At the time, I thought I might like to be appointed to a board or, com or commission. And so I submitted my name for a number of city, county, and board positions. But I wasn't appointed to any of them. Around that same time, an opening became available on the Duluth City Council. And I thought, I have some things I'd like to say about city government. I think I'll run for that position. And when it's all over and done with, maybe somebody will remember who I am and appoint me to a board or commission. Well, I made the decision to run at the last minute, and I ended up filing on the last day, 10 minutes before the closing. And I was so nervous and shaking so badly that I couldn't fill out the form legibly, and I had to ask for another one. But I was committed to working as hard as I could to win that position. And to my surprise, my campaign took off. It resonated with people, and I went on to win by a substantial margin. I was honored to serve on the Duluth City Council for 12 years, and during that time, I served in a number of leadership positions, three, years as, or three times as vice president, twice as president, and eight years as deputy mayor. And I've never wanted for an appointment to a border commission since. In 1999, which was an election year, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and I decided to step aside and take care of my health rather than to run for a fourth four-year term on the Duluth City Council. Then as I finished my own treatments and was regaining my energy, my husband, then State Senator Sam Solon, was diagnosed with malignant melanoma, and he died 10 months later. And that was the saddest day of my life. The day after Sam's funeral, a group of friends and colleagues came to my house and they persuaded me to run for his seat in the Minnesota Senate, a seat which he had held for 31 years. I was filled with grief, but I thought this would be a way to keep myself focused and to honor his legacy by completing his last year of his term in the Senate. So I made the decision to run, and I won the seat joining the Minnesota Senate representing Duluth in January 2002. I went on to win two more four-year terms, spending a total of nine years in the Senate. Then, nearly four years ago, Mark Dayton asked me to join him on the campaign to the governor's office. With some sadness about leaving the Senate, I agreed to take on this new challenge in my life. Looking back, it is amazing to me that one last minute decision 25 years ago has led me down the path of so many outstanding experiences in public service and ultimately presented me with the opportunity to serve as Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor. My pen is a bit steadier than it was 25 years ago. But my resolve to make my community and our state a better place has never lessened. Throughout my careers, both as a psychologist and as a public servant, I have been interested in helping to solve the problems facing our state. And while the issues have changed over the years, I have continued to work on initiatives that aim to provide real value for Minnesotans reforms that will have an impact on people's lives and innovations that further the public good. On the city council, I work to lay the groundwork for a better Duluth, helping carve the path for the economic revitalization of that that city is now experiencing with new developments, new businesses, new jobs, new growth, and new energy. In the State Senate, I worked 
to build on Minnesota's nation-leading stature in healthcare delivery and innovation. I helped to establish the nation's foremost green energy policies, and I advocated for those less fortunate in our society. Over the past three years in this office, it has been a great privilege and my distinct honor to serve the people of Minnesota in our, as our state's 47th Lieutenant Governor. I am proud of the many important achievements that we have made to build a better Minnesota. And I have no plans to slow down or to scale back the work in the year ahead. Above all, as Lieutenant Governor, my work on behalf of Minnesota's aging population has been rewarding and productive. When our elder population stays engaged and active in their communities, they live longer, healthier, and happier lives. And that creates a win-win-win situation for our seniors, our communities, and our healthcare system. This administration has accomplished nation-leading, transformative work to empower and improve the quality of life enjoyed by our Minnesota seniors. And I look forward to building on that important progress in 2014. I also look forward to continuing my efforts to improve the quality of life enjoyed my, by Minnesotans with disabilities by implementing our state's Olmstead plan. And I look forward to continuing my work in coordination with the Center for German and European Studies at the University of Minnesota on the benefits of past international policy exchanges and building relationships between Minnesotan and German policymakers on issues related to energy and health care. <laughs> Knowing now the full responsibilities and the endless possibilities of this high office, I can say now with confidence that the highest calling in a democratic society is the call to public service. Scripture tells us that if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and serve all. I have applied that simple truth to my service at the local and the state levels over the past 25 years, and I know it to be true. We are not elected to serve our own selfish interests, nor special interests, nor political issues, interests. Instead, the governor and I, and the 201 legislators from across the state who serve in this magnificent building, were chosen by their communities to serve first and always the public's interest. Working each day with humility, despite our differences, we as Minnesotans fulfill the stubborn belief that this small group of committed individuals with varied beliefs and interests can come together in common cause to build a better Minnesota. And like those who came before us, I believe we have. And in this generation, we can still draw wisdom from those who served before us. Circling the Senate chamber are the words of a man whom many consider one of history's greatest, most accomplished legislators, U.S. Senator Daniel Webster. And his words read, I quote, let us develop the resources of our land, call forth its powers, build up its institutions, and promote all its great interests and see whether we also, in our day and generation, may not perform something worthy to be remembered. That has been my calling the past 25 years. That has been my charge. And it is a charge I believe I have fulfilled. There is always more work to be done, always a new cause to be taken up, always someone in need of uh, a servant leader armed with courage and compassion. We are fortunate in Minnesota to have so many good and qualified leaders standing ready to answer that call to service. So today, I have made the decision after more than two decades of service 
in public office, to step aside and to let someone else take the reins of the work that lay ahead. I plan to finish my term as Lieutenant Governor and return to Duluth in January 2015. This is a decision that I've given much thought, much reflection, and an equal dose of prayer. A decision I am confident is right for me, my loved ones, and my future. A good life rests on the balance we make between our work, our families, and our own personal self-fulfillment. And today that desire for balance is calling me home. For three years, I have made it my mission to help Minnesota's aging population prepare for and own their futures. And I plan now in the next phase of my life to benefit from the wisdom of my own advice. For more than 50 years, the North Shore of Lake Superior has been my home. And each day when the sun sets over the lake's bowing horizon from my home on Park Point, I can see the day's last light dancing across the rolling waves, giving way to starry nights. Each morning, a new day casts its gaze across the waters and brings with it new choices and new possibilities. So as the sun sets on my term as Lieutenant Governor next year, I hope first and foremost that the good work we have done these four years to build a better Minnesota will ripple all across the state and shine in the hearts of all those we've served. And when the sun rises on a new day, I know the new chapter of my life will bring it with it many opportunities for me to serve, more ways to give back, and more, and, and more chances to make a difference for the citizens of Minnesota. And until then, I have more work to do here in St. Paul. And I plan to do that work with the same commitment and vigor that I have given to the cause of public service these last many years. I thank Governor Dayton for presenting me with this opportunity to serve. And I thank my staff for their tremendous efforts to help me in my efforts to build a better Minnesota. But above all, I thank Minnesotans from the bottom of my heart for giving me this unequivocal chance to improve the prospects of our shared future and make our state a better place for all those who come after us. For that, I will be eternally grateful. And with that, I will take any questions that you might have. So Lieutenant Governor, why step aside now instead of waiting four more years? Why is it important right now? I think I'm ready to move into the third phase of my life and, I, and to take on new opportunities. Um, I've, been, I've been Lieutenant Governor for four years. I was in the State Senate for nine years. I've been traveling Highway 35 for almost 15 years now. I've been in public service for 25 years. I, I, I have, um, my, my father died last year. My mother's very ill. I have a 19-year-old grandson who grew up during my years in public service. I'd like to spend more time with the people I love. Can we discuss with the governor any possibilities that you might Have I discussed? Any possible candidates that might step into your place? No. That's a, the that's a governor's decision. Lieutenant Governor, you, uh, you're stepping down. You've given us uh, reasons why. Did your relationship change with the governor? Are you dissatisfied with this work? Is there anything that happened that you expected or didn't expect here? Lieutenant Governor, that made you make this decision? You know, I, I knew that coming into the job that um, it was wide open. I knew that there wasn't a lot that described Lieutenant Governor. Um, and I, and I knew that it was an opportunity for me to focus on things that I'm passionate about. It was an opportunity for me to focus on the senior population, which I think has become a forgotten population, and, um, 
and it's a growing population that will expand by over 100 percent between 2010 and 2030, while the rest of the population is staying relatively flat. People are living longer, and they are living healthier, and we're losing our workforce. And I just knew that there were a number of issues that needed to be addressed in order for us to keep a vibrant workforce. So I've really focused a lot on education of kids. Um, I'm, I'm uh, co-chair of Grad Nation. I'm also um, honorary chair of the Alliance uh, with Youth and have worked a lot on, uh, on initiatives that will focus on filling that workforce, but also bringing value to our senior population, which has not had much attention. And, and we as a culture have not valued our seniors very much like other cultures have. So it has been my passion to bring attention to seniors, to keep them, and me, I'm, a senior, I'm in that population too, to keep us engaged so that we do live happier, healthier lives. A month or so ago, you told me that you don't talk to Governor Dayton that often. You didn't have much contact with him. Did that surprise you as Lieutenant Governor? And also, what was your relationship? And did that surprise you? I, um, the governor and I talk when we need to, but we have communication staff, we have policy staff, we have, um, they really um, keep things going. We have numbers of memos that we send back and forth. And so the governor has his initiatives he's working on. I have my initiatives that I'm working on. Well, to ask you directly but respectfully, uh, were you frozen out? Was I frozen? In the governor's out? office here, did you expect to be more, uh, do more, and be more a part of it? And were you frozen out? I think I expected to be more involved in some policy initiatives. And I found ways to do that through the Center for German and European Studies, by working on uh, senior initiatives, disability initiatives, nutrition initiatives, education initiatives. So I found a way to fill that void. Did the governor ever ask you to stay aboard, to stay out for the next second round? No. And why isn't the governor here? The governor is with the president in Washington. 